Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Night Sky, our uh, August 11th edition of the Virtual Night Sky, presented to you by the School of Earth and Space Exploration and Arizona State University. My name is Rick Alling, and I'm pleased to be your host tonight. And uh, we've got a, a really good uh, show put together for you. I'm going to uh, kind of just go over some of that and then some of some details, some housekeeping things about the program and uh, how you can interact with it. And uh, then I'm going to introduce some presenters. But first, uh, the team. So I'd like to just uh, acknowledge um, uh, Meg Hufford is with it and Meg is my colleague at ASU. Meg and I handle uh, a lot of the campus visitation. So our world is about people coming to see us and we operate out of an amazing building and we have some amazing facilities that uh, support space sciences and the work of ASU. Uh, uh, during COVID, we invented this particular program, a way for us to stay in touch with everybody. And so we haven't forgotten about you. Uh, we still want you to come back to our facility soon enough. We'll be there pretty soon. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, this is our way of sort of engaging. So some of you are going to be new tonight. I know we have a bigger audience tonight because we have a really wonderful uh, part partnership and a collaboration with the Arizona Historical Society. And so thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Uh, we also had a visit earlier in the week from some folks at Mirabella, and I wanted to sort of like do just a quick little shout out. And thanks for coming over. And I'm glad we had a chance to uh, sort of interact with you a little bit. And uh, I understand from that visit that there's this room at Mirabella where lots of you like to watch this program together. So thank you for doing that. And I hope you're having a good time tonight. Uh, Kim Baptista is your webmaster and my our webmaster, and she is uh, uh, the one that kind of puts all this together, keeps the communication going. You're going to hear from Kim after the program in about a day or so, so she'll uh, uh, kind of circulate uh, some information and a survey, and we do like to hear back from you. We do really take very seriously your comments, what you say about the program, what, you, uh, what you'd what you like to see in the future, because that's how we put together our shows. Um, two students tonight, Alicia Hyatt and Alex Blanche. And they've been with us since the very beginning. We've been doing this for over a year and a half now. And so, so welcome, uh, Alex and, uh, and Alicia. Thank you. And then we have a special guest tonight. I'm going to introduce him in a minute. But before there, I got some little sort of housekeeping things. So this is a Zoom webinar format. That means you can't chat with us, but you can ask questions. So there's a question and answer button on the bottom of your screen. And we do engage you in questions. We'll answer them along the way. That's one of the roles that the students play. And we also will pick some of the questions to answer during breaks. The first presenter tonight has a lot to talk about, about the Mars Perseverance rover. And so if things come up, you have an idea, uh, we'll, we'll just, we'll make sure that we, uh, we we can stop and take your questions as we need. The closed captioning is also uh, turned on. It's enabled. And so it might be on your screen right now. There is a way to turn that off if you like. And because there is a little closed captioning button where you can kind of uh, disable it, but it is uh, something that helps us and uh, it helps for our posting recordings afterwards. And uh, then finally, I think a uh, shout out to some teachers. We have uh, just uh, classes are getting started. The semester is beginning. Uh, fall, uh, kids are going back to school. And we've been hearing a lot from some of the teachers that have been uh, participating with us in programs over the years. Um, so uh, we still have uh, just like the public shows that we have suspended for COVID. Uh, we also are not doing the K-12 visits, uh, the school buses and the kids coming, but we are engaging in their classroom in meaningful ways. So if you're a teacher or if you know a teacher and uh, want to sort of suggest that maybe they get a hold of us, we can do that as well. And for those teachers that come and send your students to our program, thank you very, very much. I think that's a, that's a super, super thing to do. I think that's it for the, for the big picture. Tonight, we're going to have a uh, the bulk of the evening as a presentation and an update on the activities of the Mars Perseverance rover uh, traveling around Mars even today. Uh, then we're going to kind of do a little bit about some planets. We'll have some polls and some question and answer along the way. There is a planet watch tonight. I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about what you're seeing in the night sky, especially uh, the relationship with Venus and the moon tonight. And then uh, uh, and something about Jupiter. The outer uh, solar system is coming into view right about now as well. And then uh, we got to sort of give you a little primer on the Perseids. The Perseids are, are peaking tonight. So we'll talk about that before we leave. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Ernest Cisneros. 
Thomas Ernest works for the NASCAM, NASCAM Z team. Uh, he is staff at Arizona State University and uh, he is, uh, has an integral role in uh, 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 translating and disseminating the data that comes down from the Perseverance rover every day from Mars. And so we've asked him to come uh, tell us what they're doing, uh, why it's important to ASU and Arizona, and we also uh, uh, want to kind of ask him some questions about sort of the progress of what's going on on Mars and how's that machine working and uh, and all of that kind of thing. So Ernest, uh, please please join and uh, and uh, everybody welcome Ernest Cisneros. Hey, good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm actually sitting in mission operations here at ASU um, and uh, hanging out uh, watching our big screen and looking at uh, data coming down uh, from various spacecraft, including uh, Mars 2020 and uh, the images from MassCam Z. So <clears throat> let me, uh, before I start my presentation, a little bit about me. Uh, I have a background in geology and computer science. Uh, my role on the MassCam Z team is building what's called the ground data system. And that's the, the combination of computers, software, uh, procedures that we do every day to um, down, uh, downlink the data from the JPL ground data system uh, that's coming from the rover. We process those uh, images, uh, calibrate them, which allows us to extract uh, the scientific information that's contained in those images. And uh, we create mosaics from uh, various uh, different um, looks by the camera. We can command the camera to uh, move around on the mast of the rover and uh, take uh, pictures and we can stitch those together digitally uh, to make mosaics. Um, and I've been doing this for now about 26 plus years. Uh, oh, worked on a variety of missions, a lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Uh, uh, I'm currently uh, supporting uh, Mars Science Laboratory, which is the other rover on Mars. Mars 2020. I also support the Psyche mission, uh, and we're doing some support work uh, for an instrument on Lucy. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is the MassCam instrument, a MassCam Z specifically. This is a model of uh, one of the cameras life size. It's composed of uh, the camera tube, which has the optical components. Um, it has motors. These uh, little silver things are motors that move the optical components to let us zoom in and out uh, to see close in or farther away. We have a filter wheel here, this circular um, disc, and there are seven filters and this motor moves that uh, around and puts the filter in the light path, uh, the light coming in at this. At, this is a light baffle and the light comes in, goes through those optical components uh, passes through that filter and then hits the, the CCD back here, gets recorded, and then uh, at certain points uh, during the mission gets downlinked to, uh, again, JPL, and then we get the data from JPL. So I'm going to share my presentation now, and we can get started. All right. Uh, and I just have to uh, give a shout out to Dr. Jim Bell, who's a professor here at ASU, who wrote the MassCam Z uh, proposal uh, for the instrument that was selected, and his deputy PI, Justin Mackey, who uh, actually works at JPL. And again, my name is Ernest Cisneros, and I'm the GDS lead. So as I mentioned, uh, we work with JPL. JPL runs a, a series of deep space network antennas. Uh, uh, located around uh, the world, and they are located about 120 degrees from one another. So at any one point in time, uh, spacecraft flying throughout our solar system can be in view of at least one and sometimes two of those antennas. And as the Earth is revolving, um, we get passed off between one station to the next. And those are in Madrid, Goldstone, California, and Canberra, Australia. <clears throat> So at, at, at around Mars currently, there's a series of orbiting spacecraft that we use as data relays from the rover on the surface up to those spacecraft that then talk to this deep space network. Uh, and we're, we're currently talking through Odyssey, which has been around Mars for well over 20 years, uh, 
sorry, I'm not sure that's the right number, but it's been, it's, it's an old hand uh, in orbit around Mars. Uh, we have uh, MRO, the Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. We have a spacecraft Maven and a ESA spacecraft called TGO, uh, Trace Gas Orbiter. Uh, all four of those spacecraft act in some way as a data relay for the Mars 2020 rover. Um, as you may have heard, or maybe if you were uh, doing other things and not paying attention to NASA, uh, the Mars 2020 rover uh, landed in Jezero Crater, which is on the edge of Isidus Basin. And uh, Jezero is at 18 degrees north and 77 degrees east uh, on the surface of Mars. Uh, and it's perched again on the edge of this Isidus Basin. So if you look at the upper right-hand corner, that's uh, uh, MOLA, which is uh, Mars uh, uh, um, laser altimetry data. So it's showing elevation data with the purple being uh, low elevation and red to white being the highest elevation. So we're sort of in the mid uh, elevation range for, for Mars. And the lower picture on the right uh, is a geologic map constructed uh, during the Mars 2020 uh, flight a cruise. And it was done by the uh, various members on the Mars 2020 team, geologists and various other team members. Everybody was given a quad, uh, mapped their quad. Those quads were brought together to create that geologic map. And so you can see this sort of black ring, that's the landing ellipse uh, of, uh, on Mars for the Mars 2020 rover. And we landed somewhere towards the bottom uh, right-hand side of that landing ellipse. And I'll show you in a moment uh, a better uh, location of that. Uh, the purple and red units are the floor of Jezero Crater. Uh, and during our mission, we're going to drive up onto that blue uh, formation, which is an alluvial fan coming out uh, of this channel that's uh, coming uh, from the upper left-hand corner, and you can kind of see it snaking. It's a yellow surrounded by orange units uh, snaking down to that alluvial fan. So our goal will be to drive up onto that fan as we uh, during the lifetime of our mission, during the lifetime of our mission, to find uh, samples to uh, extract and cache. I'm going to switch for a moment from that map to um, my web browser, so I can show you. NASA has this great uh, website um, called "Where is MRO?" or "Where is Mars 2020?" Sorry, too many spacecraft to remember. <laughs> Um, and so you can see here, this is Jezero Crater um, and um, the landing ellipse here in blue. And then we can zoom in and you can see where we landed uh, in this pile of little white dots. So we got set down by the descent stage right here at this dot uh, here. Well, actually, not that dot. Which dot was it? No, it was that dot. I don't know why it starts at Sol 13, but, uh, and we sat there, whoops, sat there for a while, <clears throat> getting everything uh, uh, turned on and checked out before we started driving off uh, and doing the various things that we do. So check out this tool. Um, uh, it shows you the flight of the helicopter, uh, the rover path, um, and I'm sure in the future there'll be more information being shown on this. And right now we're trying to skirt this sand uh, dune area and get around, and you can see we've already sort of come around and we're following the helicopter, which is flying ahead of us here. Hey, Ernest, can I interrupt for a second? Can you talk about uh, a soul as opposed to a day? And so I saw on that map where it said soul 163 or yeah. something like that. Is that? Yeah, let me let me bring that back here real quick. So on Mars, this is the concept of a sol, which is uh, equates to an Earth day, but um, it's not exactly 24 hours on Mars. Uh, Martian day is 24 Earth hours plus about 40, 43 minutes. Um, so it's slightly longer. Um, 
And so when we first landed, um, the entire Mars 2020 team was uh, working on what was called Mars time, meaning we were tracking the clock on Mars uh, and our shift was starting at eight o'clock uh, in the morning on Mars. Uh, and over uh, weeks of operations, that of course starts migrating around uh, the Earth clock. And so we started off um, normal work hours and that shifted into evening, late evening, early morning. Uh, and so for about the first 90 sols of operations, we were on what was called Mars time. And so we were working, not all of us weren't working round the clock, but our shifts were working round the clock as that, that uh, our time shifted around. So we're now off of Mars time. We're now on uh, modified Mars time, meaning we're bouncing between uh, early start and a late start. Um, and we don't have any nighttime, uh, late nighttime shifts. Uh, we mostly work early in the morning to early afternoon or uh, late morning to uh, late afternoon. The, the rover itself, I guess I'm just making a big assumption, but it doesn't work at night, right? It operates during the Mars daytime and right. this thing. But does it send information back to you during the night? I mean, can that happen? Or no, it, it generally uh, goes to uh, you just let it go to goes, sleep. Goes to sleep at night. Okay. Oh, and we do that mostly for thermal uh, reasons. It gets fairly cold at night on Mars, uh, and the instruments don't like to be, operate at that temperature. So even, even the communication system generally is, excuse me, offline, unless um, we, there's a necessary emergency uh, for some reason. Okay, that's, that's great. So let me switch back to my presentation. Da -da. Okay. okay, so again, screenshot, go to that website, find that website, check it out, uh, it, and keep you know, go back every every day and you'll see uh, what, if we've driven, you'll see new progress. If we haven't driven, uh, you know, we'll stay, stay put in one place uh, for a while. Uh, so what have we been doing since we landed? Well, one, we successfully landed on the surface of Mars. Uh, and, and that's no mean feat because about 48%, only 48% of missions to Mars are successful. And that includes orbiters, landers, uh, in that statistic. So more than 50% fail when trying to get to Mars. Uh, so we count ourselves lucky that we actually landed and, and are operational. And we call that Sol Zero, and that was February 18th. Uh, so after the descent, Sage uh, dropped us off, nothing really happened till the next Martian day when we started to power up the rover subsystems, uh, the uh, main computing, uh, compute element called the RCE, um, and that's sort of the brains of the rover, and then all of the subsystems like uh, the navigation system, communication system, um, and then individually uh, pairing up all of the instruments uh, and going through a checkout of all of those instruments. Uh, so during that checkout period on Sol 3, which uh, was February 21st, MassCam Z, after being turned down and, and being declared um, operational, we were able to acquire our first 360 degree panorama. Uh, and that's both one to get a sense of the landing site where we were dropped off, but two also is it's a contingency in case, God forbid, something happens. Uh, and mass cam Z is no longer operational, we can say at least we've got, you know, at least one panorama of the instrument. Uh, after all the subsystems and instruments were turned down and everything was checked out, the rover goes through a series of uh, other first uh, in mobility, making sure all the wheels move. Uh, and then once the rover is completely checked out, uh, then the engineers at uh, JPL say, okay, we're ready to drive, and then we can successfully start driving away from our landing site. Um, oh, I forgot to put what Saul that was. Um, one of the big things early on was we deployed the helicopter uh, ingenuity on the surface of Mars, and that was a big deal. Uh, and it actually took about six days for the full deployment. And so that, um, was a series of 
uh, operations that included uh, the, the helicopter was underneath the belly of the rover and there was a belly pan covering it up to protect uh, the helicopter. So the first thing we had to do was initiate the um, explosive bolts to shear and drop the belly pan. And then the rover drove off and then we inspected the belly pan to make sure it successfully separated with no damage to the belly pan, which would then let us know that there was no damage to uh, the helicopter. And then parked on the spot where we deployed the helicopter. And again, over this series of six days, the helicopter slowly extended its legs, was lowered off of the bottom of the rover to sit on the surface of Mars. And then the rover drove off about 13 feet. And we took a picture. Uh, we actually, I'll show a picture of uh, the helicopter and the rover taking with uh, a instrument called Watson that's on the end of the arm. And so the arm's kind of looking out here, looking back at the two of us, the rover and the helicopter and took a little selfie. Uh, and then on Sol 58, April 19th, we had our first successful flight of uh, Ingenuity and it took off straight up uh, uh, to about a height of 10 feet and it stayed there for about 30 seconds before it landed. Uh, and that was the first off-planet flight. Um, so that was a very big coup for, uh, for the helicopter team. Um, and then um, there was a series of other uh, shorter flights to test um, the navigation system and uh, various um, capabilities of the helicopter before it took its first real leg uh, that if you go to that website, you can see it, it started to uh, uh, travel a distance away from uh, its current position. And now that we're moving, uh, the helicopter is uh, flying out ahead of us and sort of uh, surveying the terrain ahead of us and sending back images uh, to the rover and then downlinked uh, to the JPL team to look. Ernest, I meant I meant to ask about that because on your map I saw that the, mm -hmm. the ingenuity is kind of a distance away, so it's yep. basically just staying. It's like a scout, right? So stay. Yeah. Out. So the the whole and and right uh, the helicopter uh, is what's called a technology demonstration, meaning it the helicopter is not critical to meeting the. Um, mission um, requirements, meaning the whole reason for uh, going to Mars. Uh, if the helicopter dies, we can still do all the things we need to do. But since it is a technology demonstration and part of that technology demonstration is using a helicopter to fly ahead and uh, look at the terrain and get higher resolution image, imagery from uh, just ahead of this, the rover, uh, it, it can be used to give us better insight into where to drive or where not to drive. So uh, as you notice, when I zoomed in on the web page, we were looking at uh, two different data sets, one taken from an orbiter uh, fairly far away and very low resolution that showed most of the surface of Mars. And then the little square as I zoomed in closer on uh, Jezero Crater was from MRO, um, and I forget which instrument, uh, I, I think it's high rise data, uh, which is fairly high resolution data. But even at that resolution, when you zoom all the ways in uh, to um, sort of looking at uh, the scale that we might see around the rover with the instruments, like the uh, super cam and the nav cams and the ha hazard cams, um, the pixel you know, is fairly big on top of us, so we get very low resolution data. Okay. So the helicopter can give us nice high resolution data of, of the terrain ahead of us. Yep. So uh, after the, after we, and, and we basically sat during that whole time uh, that the helicopter was doing all of these uh, checkout and first flight uh, activities, the rover sat there taking pictures of the areas around us and of course uh, imaging the helicopter and actually taking some movies, which I'll show. Um, and then we had our first successful drive campaign where we sort of uh, drove off. Now, one of the things that's uh, new in, uh, on Mars 2020 over uh, MSL is that it has a, a greater degree of autonomy. So, on MSL, the, the 
engineers at JPL who drive it tend to uh, are very particular about the path and put what are called waypoints that the rover navigates to as it's driving along um, to ensure that the rover uh, doesn't drive over terrain that it, it get, either gets stuck in or that in case of MSL with its damaged wheels, aren't gonna further damage the wheels. Um, with Mars 2020, they've built in more autonomy. And so now we can make those waypoints further away and let the rover decide by using the navigation cameras and the information that it's receiving from the navigation cameras to figure out the best path forward uh, based on all of this data that we've collected through MSL operations and uh, the Mars exploration rovers, using all that experience uh, to help the, the rover drive on its own uh, between waypoints that are further away. So after we did a couple of short drives, we actually started to test out this, okay, we're gonna you know, start changing those distance. And so if you go to that website, you'll see the spacing between points uh, are, are starting to spread out as we let the, the rover take longer and longer drives. And it, that's important because the amount of distance that we want to travel uh, is greater than MSL has driven. And to get there, we need to be able to have the rover drive on its own uh, as much as possible so that we can make better time than trying to you know finesse all of the little waypoints uh, and control where it's going. To cover cover more territory yeah. and even at, even at that you're almost uh six months almost on yep. the surface and we're at 1.63 kilometers that's yep. it's, it's like yeah. about a mile yeah. and i know it doesn't <laughs> seem like a lot but it really i mean considering most of the time we're sitting there you know for the helicopter and for our own uh what's called um uh the um commissioning of the the rover and then yeah the commissioning no, and I get it. It's, yeah that's super yeah. cool so on Sol 164, we had our first successful sample acquisition and, and that was uh, almost about a week ago. Uh, and I was just alerted prior to this that NASA had, uh, sent out a press release saying the sample we had collected was not quite up to snuff. Uh, it was not, uh, not a good solid rock sample. It was a little bit more friable and broke up uh, inside the sample tube. Uh, but that's okay. We're, we've collected it, we've um, uh, documented it, and uh, now we're driving off um, to a new, uh, different location. And as you saw, we were skirting around that, that sand dune area, so we're driving around that and following the helicopter on its way. So we're 170 sols and counting, one sample collected out of uh, 38 total that we can collect, uh, that we need to collect to, to meet our mission requirements. Uh, and uh, 1.63 kilometers of who knows how many kilometers we will drive over the lifetime of this mission. That's great. Um, so let me, so what I'm gonna share now with you are, uh, I asked our team here at uh, ASU to give me their recommendations for the images, their favorite uh, mass cam Z images. Uh, and so the first one is from Sol 3, and this is that first panorama. And it looks really funny because again, we're taking it from the mast, which is the arm and the head rotates on top and tilts up and down to let the mast cam C instrument C. Uh, so we moved it over uh, the full rotation and a series of up and down motions to get this panorama. And so you get some distortion here because it should really be wrapping around. Um, but you can see the, the RTG, which is on the, the back end of the, the rover, and it looks like that big barrel with fins on it. And then to the left of that is another barrel looking thing. That's, uh, oh, I forget what that is. Uh, yeah. I've forgotten what that thing is. And on the right-hand side is our the high gain antenna, which is a little hard to see. And that's the, if we're talking directly to earth, that antenna moves around um, uh, to get in the proper orientation. Uh, and then you can see the arm sort of sitting on the left shoulder of, of the rover. Um, and then the big circle down at the, uh, just below the arm head is the sample caching system. Uh, 
So here's that selfie taken with Watson, which is out on the edge of the arm. Uh, and I included a blow up. Um, so that was on this particular saw on the drive path um, where we had dropped off the rover, uh, dropped off the helicopter from the rover uh, and then driven off about 13 feet. Uh, and then we um, sat there for a couple of saws uh, uh, before we drove off to what was considered the safe distance uh, to ensure that the helicopter wouldn't uh, errantly run into us if something bad happened uh, in preparation for its first flight. And here's a video of that first flight. Um, and this again, so that was Sol 46 and then uh, Sol 58 um, was that first flight. And it kind of looks like nothing's happening because the helicopter is just kind of sitting there and then you'll start to see the blades start to rotate. There they go. And then all of a sudden you'll see it pop up um, to that 10 foot height and it'll sit there uh, for about 30 seconds and then um, it will finish that. And that was, that was the first flight. Uh, and that's all it was meant to do initially. And by doing that, um, the, the helicopter team proved, yes, you can fly a helicopter uh, in the atmosphere of Mars. Their design and uh, control mechanisms for the helicopter work as expected. Uh, and that technology has now is now considered proven spaceflight technology and will likely uh, fly on future missions uh, of rovers to, to Mars, uh, both for uh, US and uh, probably ESA missions. Uh, this is Sol 68. And so as we're driving around, um, we're, uh, Mass Cam Z is, uh, has various duties. We help with rover uh, driving. Sometimes we'll look ahead of our drive path and take stereo images uh, to help uh, figure out where to drive. Sometimes we'll kind of like, as you're driving along the highway, you look off to your left or your right, uh, and you're looking at interesting terrain. Um, and as I mentioned, we're driving towards this big alluvial fan that comes out of this channel. Um, and this is uh, a, a, a remnant, uh, we believe, of that uh, alluvial fan, and it was named Kodiak, and you can see uh, what appears to be, uh, and, but since we're kind of far off, we don't know for, for a fact, but what appears to be uh, bedding in that fan from uh, layered deposition of materials. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't drive up close to this. We're sort of driving past this, and this is an enhanced color uh, image. So um, as I mentioned, we have these various filters. Uh, filter zero is uh, what's called a clear filter and it lets in all of the visible uh, wavelengths, uh, but we can play with the uh, stretch of that, the RGB elements of that image to enhance. Uh, and so that's why the rocks in the foreground kind of look a little purplish uh, relative to that outcrop. They don't really look like that. Uh, if you were staying on the surface of Mars, everything would kind of have a, a reddish hue to it. Uh, this is another enhanced color, although it's stretched less, but you can kind of see the, the rocks in the near, uh, the near field are sort of purplish. And then this is looking off at a hill that's, uh, that was uh, named uh, Santa Cruz. Um, so the Mars 2020 mission, uh, is using a naming convention of parks around the world. Um, each of the rover missions have used different naming schemes to name um, the features that we're seeing uh, in, in a nod to the globalization of uh, space exploration. We're using not just US parks, but parks across uh, all nations. So you're gonna start seeing uh, some maybe perhaps different names that you haven't ever seen before um, come up for features on the surface of Mars uh, through the Mars 2020 project. Uh, here's another remnant of what we think is the, uh, the Delta poking out in the distance. Uh, and this is not a stretched image. So you can see everything has more of a reddish hue. The, the sky looks um, uh, pretty, uh, doesn't have a blue sky. We you keep, uh, there are times where we do uh, white balance um, 
or a, it, it's a, a stretch to make it look as if you were looking through an earth atmosphere. Um, uh, and that gives it a very completely different uh, uh, look to the scene. It's still, things are still red, uh, but the sky brightens up a lot more uh, in the contrast between rocks and the regolith, the unconsolidated material uh, is a bit more stark than it is here where everything kind of blends together. And if you're not a trained geologist, it's kind of hard to pick out the differences uh, between sand, rock and uh, rock outcrop. And so this was taken on Sol 77. And this is Sol 151. Uh, and that is the sampling tube in the hole that we drilled in this rock. Um, and so the, on the end of the arm, there are a couple of different instruments. So the arm rotates around to place the instrument of choice facing the rock outcrop um, for it to do its work. And on one uh, side is the drill. Um, so it goes through this intricate dance of reaching up underneath the rover to get a sample tube, pull the sample tube out, um, present it to the rock drill. And as it's drilling, it's coring that out. And then it'll extract that tube and then put it back up into the sample uh, caching system. And there's a picture uh, of the drill head. Um, and you can see in the center, uh, dead center, that, that uh, copper looking is part of the sample tube. Uh, so the, the coring mechanism has got the sample tube out of, out of the hole and we're getting ready to present it back into the, uh, into the sampling system for storage until we uh, deposit it for pickup. And, and this this whole device is actually on the end of the arm. Is it, that right? It's not. A, so you know, if you think of the end of the arm as being a box, and each facet, you know, so one one face of the box connects to the arm, and then this face will have a tool, Watson, uh, and I forget oh, I, I what the orientation. Okay. And this face might have the drill bit. This uh, there's Pixel, which is another camera system. Okay. Uh, so so it presents those faces to the rock. Uh, surface uh, or outcrop uh, when it needs to uh, do that particular operation, whether it's uh, use the cameras or use the drill. And it's a it's a main feature, I guess. Maybe you you, you said it, but let's recap. But uh, another new feature of this particular program is to collect these samples for a right. future mission to like go up and grab them, right? So, right. So yeah, all we're doing is collecting the samples, and the MSL rover also drills, oh, it, it, it normally uh, drills, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the, the hardness of the, the rockets drilling, will drill uh, a shallow hole. And sometimes they use uh, an instrument called ChemCam, which is on the mass and shoots a, a laser spectroscopy uh, or shoots a laser to get chemical spectroscopy from uh, zapping these points. And so they'll, they're able to make a hole and then get a chemical signature uh, by zapping holes up and down. In, in that case, it's like a powder, but what your, your goal here is actually to get like chunks. Some holes, yeah, so like our, you, you know, if you've ever, yeah, if you've ever seen a core, um, uh, intact yeah, core, yeah, okay, we're guess. trying to get that. But, okay. uh, but in this case, I guess the rock was friable enough yeah. that it, um, it just broke up inside the, inside the sampling tube. And so we actually looked at it through Masscam Z, and then there's actually another camera inside the sampling, um, uh, the turret that is the sampling container that actually looks at a much higher resolution into the tube to see what the condition of the core is uh, before it's capped and sealed up um, uh, for its return back to Earth. And as you said, all our job is during our primary mission is to collect the samples. We have nothing to do with returning it. So at some point in our mission, we will um, cache, uh, and it's still not decided whether it will be one or two or more than two caching sites on the surface, but we'll deposit these samples uh, at a location for whatever mission comes along to pick them up in the future. Um, yeah. 
Um, and so here's some pictures of at least the ASU team. Uh, the MassCam Z team is actually an international team. We have partners uh, in Germany, uh, Denmark, um, various other places, Canada, uh, our neighbors to the north. Uh, but these are all folks here at ASU, graduate students, uh, professional staff, um, and other researchers that work on the MassCam Z instrument uh, data and uh, help uh, do operations uh, and, and make March 2020 a success. Uh, one of the last things I'll share with you is I asked uh, our Downlink team, uh, which happened to be all women, um, give me some quotes for, for uh, your time uh, while working on March 2020. And here's what I got. <laughs> I won't read them out loud, uh, but they were they ran the gamut from very professional to, huh, interesting, okay, I like that. Uh, my personal favorite is ice cream, it makes everything better. So what, one of the um, um, uh, side effects of COVID is originally for Mars missions, during that time when we were on Mars, uh, on Mars time, we were supposed to actually be co-located at JPL, but because of COVID-19, that didn't happen. And one of the big pluses of being um, co-located JPL is the, the Mars operations team have a freezer where they have ice cream around the clock, yeah. ice cream all the time. So, so we had to get a, a freezer for our mission ops so we could have ice cream. Because it made everything better. I was thinking about this earlier today. This really is a COVID mission, right? It launched yeah. about a year ago, right? Uh, November, was it? And yep. then landed in uh, February. And uh, yeah, we, yeah uh, so. we unfortunately missed the launch. Um, oh, that's right. You guys couldn't go. They, uh, we there was restricted go. access to the launch itself. Right. That's right. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know. well, unfortunately, but, you know, it worked nonetheless. And we've been uh, uh, doing doing the job that we were hired to do and, and actually doing uh, pretty, pretty well at it. So. But I'm going to ask the team to get ready for some questions for you. But I have one real quick is um, uh, what's the length of the mission? So the missions have a primary mission yeah. objectives. And what's the one? So you're uh, six months in almost. How long is this uh, supposed to go? Six months. Yeah. And no, however many souls that was. Yeah. Um, so um, the, the primary mission is a year and a half. Mars time, and which turns out to be like close to two Earth years. Okay. Um, and the and the goal is there are on all NASA missions there are these um, what are called level one mission requirements, and these are the ones that are used to measure whether or not the mission is a success. So um, the biggest level one is that we need to collect and document these 38 samples that will be uh, eventually returned to Earth. Uh, and then there are some other requirements uh, talking about uh, what we have to encounter. Uh, so there was a, a lengthy process early on um, after the mission was um, announced, then there was a whole round of um, uh, what were called AOs, announcements of opportunities for the instrument suite, and those were selected. Once those were selected and you and we had a better understanding of the capabilities of, of the rover, then a whole series of meetings began uh, to, to assess where on Mars to go uh, for this particular mission uh, as, it, uh, as the design evolved and the sampling system um, uh, was decided and, and how the mission should run. So, there were, uh, I forget how many, I think there was a total of four big missions where uh, the scientific community came together and argued, uh, eventually whittling down uh, um, sites to like about five sites. Um, and then uh, the Mars office at NASA then took those under advisement and then decided on Jezero Crater as being the best place to, to take the mission. And so based on that, then requirements are levied in terms of the kinds of rocks that we're gonna see. Um, you know, and one of the things that we're looking for in these samples is signs of uh, early life uh, on Mars contained in what we think to be 
uh, this alluvial fan in what we hope uh, that alluvial fan was created uh, when Mars was wetter, and so that we're going to find, um, and then therefore probably chances are, you know, hopefully so find our best uh, chance, right, uh, the existence of some kind of critter or uh, something in those uh, outcrops. Excellent. Hey, I'm going to just uh, put a, uh, a hold for a minute, and I'm going to ask uh, Alicia and Alex to make their way onto the screen so they can actually uh, uh, ask some questions if, or. Uh, See if we have some audience questions for you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think I might go ahead and actually launch our poll while Alex takes some questions for okay. us, if that's all right. Maybe yep. we'll multitask. Um, so I'm just going to launch these this poll. Uh, and the first question is, where are you viewing from? And the second is, so, how many people? So. Do we need to have uh, Ernest stop share to get the, there it is. Okay. I no. uh, okay. Do, right? Right. okay. We'll just have it on the side here. Um, so where are you viewing from? And then how many people, people are viewing this presentation with you? So if you wanna just answer that super quickly um, and then I will pass it over to Alex to ask Ernest and Rick our remaining questions. Okay, so we have a couple uh, good questions for Ernest. Uh, the first one is from Zeta. And uh, they ask, how much data do you downlink each day? Uh, it actually varies. <laughs> uh, it, some days we um, actually don't get any data, not, and, not, and not so much because we haven't taken data, um, but the, the data as it's acquired is then put into these what are called priority bins. And uh, as we start to offload that onto the, uh, into the downlink uh, chain, whether it's through uh, one of those four spacecraft or directly to the DSN, it empties the highest priority bins and then starts getting into lower bins. So the high priority bins have information that we need to do the next SOL planning. And so those are called decisional uh, passes. Uh, and we're trying to get, and we kind of know based on the orbital pass of the spacecraft, who we're going to talk to, how much data we can get, and um, what, uh, how much of that information we're going to get. And so the rest of the data then gets in these lower priority bins. Sometimes we're lucky and we'll, uh, and those are from priority one to priority 99. If we're really lucky, we'll get uh, a couple of series of passes from uh, two or more spacecraft where we'll actually go through that entire priority stack and we'll get all of the data. Sometimes we only hit the decisional uh, priority bins and we'll only get enough data to do um, the planning for the next day. And so we have to wait for the next series of passes to get uh, more, more data down. Um, we just did our first PDS release. Um, so all of the images that we've taken with MassCam Z from Sol 1 through Sol 89 were delivered to the planetary data system uh, and will be available um, uh, in about, um, at the, I forget, uh, coming up soon here in about a month. Uh, so be on the lookout for that so you can go peruse all those. And that delivery was about 454 uh, gigabytes of image data, and that included all the video and uh, mosaic data as individual frames. But we don't have to necessarily wait for that release. I mean, there's okay. images that we see all the time. Yep. And, there, and yeah. Our so, audience, our audience has access. I think to uh, they will. We're going to talk about your website where they can okay. kind of get uh, get stuff as well. That's super cool. Is there another one, Alex? Yeah, this one's a little bit of a, a bigger picture, and maybe there's not an exact answer, but Spencer wants to notice, what does success look like for the MassCam Z team at the end of the mission? Um, well, we already had it. We've, you know, success for us is we turn on, we uh, operate what's called anomaly, meaning we take pictures and, and, uh, and get back what we expect. Um, so we've already, in effect, when that, we had acquired that first 360 degree mosaic, we met our mission uh, success requirements. Uh, but the truth is, is, uh, you know, is this uh, one of the quotes say, you know, every day we get to come to work, sometimes we're looking at the images from Mars. And, so, you know, as part of your job, you're busy doing all of the tasks. And 
And every now and then you get to kind of pause and go, wait a minute, I'm looking at things that other people may not see um, because the scientists aren't interested in it or yeah. focused on other aspects uh, of the mission. Uh, and as downlink, you know, we have to look at all of the images to make sure uh, we receive everything. So we may be the only set of eyes that look at it until it gets released to the public or gets released uh, through the planetary data system. Um, so I, I think, you know, for us, success is making sure we acquire the best data from our instrument uh, because the public funded this mission and uh, we want to take the best and the most possible images of the surface of Mars uh, so we get a better understanding of Mars. Excellent. Excellent. Good, good, good questions. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, I think we, uh, we're we kind of, at the time, we have to kind of run along. Ernest, if you wouldn't mind hanging on until the end of the program. And, yep. uh, and, you all. To, and um, that would be super. I love hearing about this, and I love seeing the pictures of the team uh, because, uh, you know, things are getting, things are exciting around ASU now. Uh, classes are about to start. There's some energy going. Uh, the students are starting to arrive, and um, it's really is, uh, you guys have a really nice vibe inside that room. It's just, it's really super. And you can tell that uh, there's lots of uh, uh, lots of colleagues, uh, collegial action going on there. So thanks, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I would like to uh, kind of just switch gears a little bit. There's some stuff happening in uh, in your night sky, and uh, I know this is monsoon season. So before the program tonight, I went out and kind of took a peek around, and things looked a bit cloudier than they were last night. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't see some stuff. So let me just share a screen with you. I'm just going to kind of show you some things. There's a we've started this uh, kind of little idea. We call it Planet Watch. <clears throat> And uh, let me just show you how this works. I, I borrowed the system from uh, uh, from the center, uh, the Marston Exploration Theater at ASU, and I've got it here in my living room, and so I can kind of show you what's going on here. Uh, so I'm gonna. That's your sun, and this is uh, there's some planets floating around in the in sort of the, the in space. But before I go too far, I just wanted to show you something here because it's going to relate to the Perseids. Let me just show you some some objects here. All of these, and I, I'm afraid I can't explain this. Sort of funny thing, this little look data thing going on down here of that string. But all of these are uh, comets. Uh, comets are, you know, kind of part of our solar system. Uh, sometimes they're classified as inner comets, the ones that are very close to us. Short period comets are the ones that kind of are act within the solar system, move close to the sun and now. And then there's long period comets, those like Halley's Comet, for example, that uh, have part of their life is way, way, way out beyond the solar system in the Oort cloud, and then they come in periodically. Uh, but there's not just a couple; there's hundreds, and there's not, uh, and they all sort of have different trajectories and different paths and things like that. So uh, later in the show, we're going to be talking about the Perseids, and I'm going to just remind you of this little view of comets that we took a look at, uh, because that's going to kind of play a role. Here is your solar system. This is actually a little bit more familiar to you. The sun is in the middle, and I put up the orbits of the eight major planets. Let me back out so you can see all of them. And I'm going to just blow up uh, some planets, because I want to show you some things that are going on. And then I'm going to try a really, really tricky maneuver where I'm going to land at my house. Wow, all of these planets are up. So first, 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 uh, let me just size things up so you can see them a little better. I've just basically blown up all the planets by about a thousand times. Let me spin around here. And so you can see uh, the Earth. I'm also going to flip this over. Watch out. This one actually sort of sometimes makes people sick. Watch out. Here we go. Yeah, I like this view right now. And let me sort of just get settled in here. So basically, what you see here is the Earth is in the foreground. That blue orbit is ours. And then up here is uh, Venus. Uh, this is Mercury. And this is Mars. And this is the Sun. And so, uh, woman, uh, Tracy S., uh, thank you for your email today. I'm actually going to formally answer you tomorrow. But somebody that was out walking last night, seems like about the same time I was, saw a really, really bright object. She called it a star. I'm going to tell you it's a planet, and it's in the western part of the sky, and it was interacting with a little sort of sliver, uh, a new moon. So the moon is only about three days old, 
we saw that little sort of crescent moon and this really, really bright object, that's Venus. And so why is it so bright? So what's happening, of course, is, the, is planets don't do their own light. Uh, the sun is here, it's reflecting off of Venus and we're sort of seeing it over here. In its orbit, it's nearing what we call the greatest elongation, uh, the distance from the sun. It never goes all the way around us, right? Because its orbit is inside the orbit of the earth. So, so over the course of the next several uh, two months, uh, Venus is going to move in its orbit, heading almost straight for us and then kind of passing between us and the sun. We, at the same time, will be moving in this direction and sort of in, in this logical direction away this way. And so that's really the interaction we're watching. What that means is Venus remains in your evening sky for a long period of time, and it's going to get brighter and brighter and brighter and move a little bit towards the south every single evening, but you can watch this all the way into November. So it's really, uh, it's really kind of fun to keep track of. And so because the moon goes through its phases every 28 and a half days, right? So about every month, a little less than a month, we have that interaction. We have that new moon, and then a couple of days later, the crescent will be next to Venus in it, it before it and then after it. And I'll show you that when we land at home. Um, so that's really kind of cool. So the big planet to watch now. And then we just spent a lot of time talking about Mars. Mars is about to get lost behind the sun. So you can see the distance between us and Mars is way really great. It's much smaller than us. Mars is really, really hard to see. You got to catch it right after sunset, and it does not show as much as it does when it's close to us, of course, in that part of the orbit. And then uh, maybe if we have time at the end of the show, I'm going to ask Ernest what happens when Mars goes behind the sun, and can we still talk to it? So uh, then the other thing I just wanted to show while you're here is one really cool thing about to happen is um, this is uh, basically uh, Jupiter is about to move into conjunction, and so you see uh, the Earth is over beyond the sun there, uh, and Jupiter is almost opposite it. And what that means is that Jupiter will be its closest during our our orbits. It is its brightest. And then if you can imagine, you're going to see the sun highest in the sky at noon. You will see Jupiter highest in the sky at midnight, right? Exactly opposite. Sun on this side, Jupiter on that side. And it's really large and in charge. I was up in the woods uh, last week and staying up late. And uh, I saw both Saturn and Jupiter rise uh, kind of in the late evening. And so, and it's uh, starting to do that uh, sooner and sooner and sooner and sooner. So uh, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be part of our nighttime sky uh, for the next several months, all the way into the next year. So watch for those. Okay, uh, this is really kind of uh, something I don't usually do, but I'm actually gonna land us on Earth. And at the same time, I am going to uh, kind of load up um, a little scene from my front yard. And I'm gonna uh, sort of like, uh, orbit uh, around this way. I'm going to kind of uh, turn everything so that this is right now. And then I'm going to have to back up about an hour. So what I wanted to show you is this is what's sort of going on in space right now. Um, I'm going to back up just one more little bit here. So you, of course, can't do this. I said back up, not go forward. Um, what you're seeing here is, let me see one thing here. Oh, oh I, got, I got one quick little problem I got to do here. What you're seeing is the orbits of the planets drawn on the sky, but of course you don't see it this way. They don't show up in your night sky. I'm looking directly towards the west. I've got Venus blown up really big, right? Like I, uh, like I had it before. I'm gonna just sort of move back until it's just above the house across the street. And so here's all those sort of planet things going on. The sun is just going behind uh, the thing. This was about eight, this was about uh, uh, four this afternoon, five this afternoon. Oh, I see. I've got the wrong latitude. So I'm going to have to. This was about an hour ago. Sun went behind the horizon. Uh, this is Mercury. This is Mars in the distance. And here's the really, really bright Venus. Let me take those planets back down to their normal size so they don't look weird. And then this is today. If I just go backwards one day, you're going to see the moon move over there. And so this is really what uh, Tracy S. was seeing. Here's the little crescent moon. This is the western horizon. 
horizon, the sun has set, and this is the planet Venus right here, getting brighter and brighter and brighter and just a little bit higher in the night sky every night for the next two months. If I go back to tonight, you will see since last night and to tonight, that little crescent moon has moved from one side of Venus and on to the next. And over the next couple of days, uh, it'll just keep moving along and moving along. And uh, the moon will go all the way around. So there's sort of your, your planets for you. I'm going to sort of switch gears here a little bit. And we're going to go to some current events and some things coming up. And then at the end of that, I got three things to show you. And then at the end of that, I want to uh, uh, sort of uh, show you the uh, uh, talk a little bit about the Perseids and what to watch for because tonight's the night to actually go out and check it out. Alicia is actually running a little thing here, called current events, and we got three things to talk to you about tonight, some things that are really coming up, and I'm kind of moving fast because I know it's the eight o'clock hour, so I wanted to kind of do this. Uh, as I said, uh, tonight we're cross-promoting with the Arizona Historical Society, and they uh, have put together this amazing and very spirited space exhibit uh, uh, celebrating space uh, in Arizona and uh, Arizona's contribution to uh, the science and to exploration of space. This is down in Tucson. It opened in May. And it will be opened uh, through November. So they have uh, some parties coming up if you're so inclined to watch for this. If you want, if you're dying to make that trip down to Tucson and uh, kind of poke around and see some things, well, I'm going to invite you to go down and check that out. It's really, really super cool. Uh, in a couple of weeks, on the 28th of this month, uh, some of us, so Kim uh, and I, and I think I heard that Alicia is going to go with us, uh, we're going to go out to Boyce Thompson Arboretum. If you've never been there, it's out to the east side of the valley, you kind of go out past Mesa, you go out past Apache Junction, you start heading up towards Superior and Globe Miami up in that area. It really isn't that far from sort of the East Valley and the edge of the valley over there. It's only about 45, 50 minutes away. It's a beautiful little place. It's up in the mountains. And we're going to go out and do a star show. This is on a Saturday night. And if you're so inclined, uh, please come. If the weather is right and the clouds are gone, uh, we'll be out there actually looking at the night sky live like we should be rather than trying to do this uh, inside in a virtual night sky format. So it's our first big, huge event, and I'd love to see you kind of come out and do that. Um, I want to show you a little bit about the Perseids and talk about that for a second. So if you'll hang on with me for a little bit more, I know we're a little bit past the hour. Alicia, if you wouldn't mind, just go forward to the next slide. You remember at the beginning, I was kind of talking about comets. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of comets swimming around our solar system. And as they travel through space, they leave a debris trail. They just like leave some stuff behind. So I think as you know, uh, you might know, comets are sort of, if you want, their makeup is ice and rock. Think about it like a dirty snow cone, right? Just take a take a bunch of ice and a bunch of gravel and stuff like that, mix it all together. And so what happens is comets approach the inner part of the solar system and they you get into the solar radiation, more and more solar radiation, that stuff starts to melt. You can imagine this, right? If the ice melts, it's holding all this together, then the rocks will just start to leave themselves behind in space. This is a really good image because this particular comet has two trails and that's really right. So the trail, the sort of the orangish one, the wide one, is its debris trail. It's just going out the back of the comet, like as if a car is driving down and throwing confetti in the air. You can imagine that confetti is just going to go out the back. The other trail is actually uh, is uh, is from the solar wind, and it's an ionization of particles in the comet, and it's shooting those out. So that is exactly the opposite of where the sun is, whereas the orange trail is exactly the opposite of the travel of the comet. And so you see them as they get a little closer to the sun, they often defray and have these two things. The important one for us is that debris trail, the orange one, because as it goes through space, it leaves stuff behind. So go back to the other slide. So this is a, just a little sort of cartoony slide about how this might work. There you see the two trails coming out of the planet, and you see it kind of coming in close to the sun. Those trails sort of like move into the distance. What happens over time, some of these comets actually cross the Earth's orbit. They actually sort of just go right, not by the Earth, right? Uh, when we go through space, 
we go all the way around. We have quite a little bit of travel to get all the way around the sun. But if one of these debris trails sort of leaves things behind within our orbit, then every year at the same time, we're going to arrive at one of those locations. Uh, a past comet has passed by, left its debris, and as we just do our regular thing orbiting around the sun, we just run into the stuff. And that's really why there are several comets uh, or uh, meteor showers a year that we can keep track of. The reason we can predict when they're going to be is because it's the movement of the Earth around the sun hitting the trails that have already been left behind. So the Perseids peaks tonight. Uh, comets are named for their radiant location. So these send, tend to radiate out of the constellation of Perseus. Perseus is below the horizon right now. So if you go out tonight, if it's not cloudy, if you go out later tonight, the later the better. I'm going to set my alarm and go out at 2.30 or 3 in the morning. I'm hoping it's going to be clear. I'm going to lay out a sort of in, in a chase lounge and I'm going to sit there for about half an hour and let my eyes adapt to the dark. And I'm going to look out and I'm hoping to see some really beautiful meteorites, uh, meteor trails go through the night sky. These are going to be the Perseids. We like to do the Perseids because in especially this year, it's a year of a new moon. Remember, we saw the moon, it has already set. So later in the night, we don't have the lunar light competition clouding up our skies. We do have the light from the city of Phoenix clouding our skies. And so they're a little bit difficult to see because of that. But uh, this is a good year to try this. And so trick is spend some time be patient, but get out so you can see, especially if you can sort of see, you don't have to see the north uh, eastern part of the sky where Perseus is going to arrive, but you see anywhere in the sky, you will be able to see uh, Perseid meteors. They will just tend to leave the area of Perseus and travel through the sky that way. And so, uh, so I'm going to invite you to do that. Uh, it is one of the most spectacular uh, uh, night sky events when it's really, really wonderful. It really is wonderful, but you have some challenges. Cloud skies, wet skies, this time of year it's monsoon, um, and you have city lights to, to uh, be, and then you're also tired. But uh, so anyway, go out and do that, and I think um, I hope we'll have some success. Well, I think we have gotten through the entire agenda of the night. I will stop a moment and kind of check my, uh, my thing, but I think we're there. Kim and uh, the team, if you want to weigh in and tell me I, I missed an announcement or something, please do. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, say thank you very much for watching. Thanks for holding on for an extra six or seven minutes. Uh, we don't we try to stay with an hour, but we don't always make it. A special uh, uh, thank you to Ernest for joining us tonight and giving us that amazing update on the Perseverance rover. It just uh, amazes me. I'm always sort of uh, uh, mindful that when I show up at work, uh, there's this, this room, it's behind the glass, that's where Ernest, Ernest was, and there's people, they're going to work on Mars. I'm going to work in Tempe, and I'm going to interact with people on my level. They're going to work, and they're their place of business is the surface of the planet Mars. And uh, they're dealing with that stuff every single day. So I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited about what they're doing. And when we open and when you guys get a chance to come visit us, you can see them in there uh, doing their work. And they're really, really special people. So thank you uh, very much, everybody. Join us again in two weeks. We're going to be kind of focusing on the Milky Way itself, how we see the Milky Way, how cultures have seen the Milky Way, and some of the constellations that are embedded in the Milky Way and how it presents itself in our night sky and uh, and other things as we see fit. So thank you very much. We'll see you in two weeks and uh, everybody have a good night.